Good morning, everybody. Warm greetings from Password Publishing House. This is Prasad, Product Manager, Password. Teaching is a very noble profession that shapes the char character, caliber, and future of an individual. <coughs> if people remember me as a good teacher, that will be the biggest honor for me, quotes APJ Abdul Kalam. Today, Password is taking another big leap by being the first publisher in India to conduct a university certified online course on professional excellence in teaching. Password takes immense pride in associating with one of the premium universities in India, a San Don Bosco University for the five day certified program for teachers. In the five days program, five qualified and vast experienced speakers from education domain will be sharing their novel ideas about teaching and learning. The speakers include Father Francis M. Peter, Professor, Strategic Communications, Saving Labor Research Institute, very commonly known as XLRI Jamshedpur. Mr. Binish K. Menon, Head, Academics and Resources, Password Publishing House. Ms. Jyoti Suru, Educational Consultant. Professor, Dr. George Collincheri, former Dean, Purdue University. And Dr. Sina Devar, Educationalist and MD, ACE Academy. We are sure that these five sessions on alternate days starting today will really help Does it kindly unmute? Okay. We are sure that these five sessions on alternate days starting today will really help teachers to face the challenges of the new normal and come out as future ready and exceptional teachers with new competencies. At the end of each day, we'll be having an assessment that has to be submitted before the commencement of the next day's session. We have sent the joining link as well as uh, other details of the program to the registered email IDs. And so far, uh, we have uh, having this information that only few have received or checked the information inside their inbox. So there is a possibility that this is there in the promotions in their inbox. So kindly note that all the participants, every time whenever we are having a session, just be prior to a session and immediately after a session, the assessment link will be sent to your email IDs. And this assessment has to be completed and submitted to us by 10 p.m. the very next day. The link for assessment will be there on our website. It will be also shared on our Facebook page for your reference. Other details will soon follow. Before we start, let me talk a few words about Assam Don Bosco University, the university which has endorsed this training program. Born with the vision to mold young minds into intellectually competent, morally upright, socially committed, and spiritually inspired citizens. Don Bosco University is a project of the Salation of Don Bosco Society, Guwahati. Presently, Salations are working in 132 countries catering to over 9 million young people worldwide. Salations have been recognized by the government of India as the single largest provider of technical education in India, next only to the government. Headquartered in Guwahati, Assam Don Bosco University is the only private university in the Northeast India among top 200 universities in India as per 2020 NIR of ranking, Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India. The university has been ranked as one of the finest in India based on different parameters like teaching, learning and resources, research and professional practices, graduation outcomes, outreach and inclusivity, and peer perception. Assam Don Bosco University Offers, offers a wide range of courses for the youth, which includes six UG programs, two integrated programs, 17 PG programs, doctoral programs, and distance education programs. The university, together with 32 colleges so far in India, every year churns out future ready citizens by imparting holistic and personalized education. Let us now watch a small video about the university. Thank you. 
is a very subjective word. Home is something every human yearns for and finds it in the most unexpected places. That's what Assam Don Bosco University wants to give you. A home. A home to learn. To grow. To prepare yourself. Not just for tomorrow. But for the future. Here in Assam Don Bosco University, you will find people who are learning just like you. Learning to be a better part of the society. And we, Assam Don Bosco University, will be there with you throughout the whole journey. We provide you with the best of everything we have. So that when you go out into the world tomorrow, you will be prepared to face the future. Because you are more than just a student here, you are a Bosconian. So come join our family of Bosconians here in the San Don Bosco University. A home for the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you very much, uh, Sri Sir, our territory manager, technical support. It is my duty now to welcome each one of you to this gathering. First, let me welcome Father Francis M. Peter, resource person of the day for today's gathering. Next, let me welcome Father Johnny Joss, STV, registrar. Assam Don Bosco University, Father Janoris Sangma STB, Chancellor and Provincial Superior, Father Stephen Maveli, Vice Chancellor of the University to this meeting. Next, my welcome is to Ms. Juhi Barwa, Director, Human Resources, Assam Don Bosco University. And very importantly, let me welcome all the participants to today's webinar. Today is the day one of our course, and we have with us Father Francis M. Peter, Professor, Strategic Communications, XLRI, one of the premium institutions in India when it comes to management education. Let me take a few minutes to introduce the resource person for you all. Father Francis M. Peter holds a PhD with MA from Madras University, MA from London University, and is currently working as Professor, Strategic Communications, XLRI, Jamshedpur. Father Francis has handled key positions at prestigious organization. He has worked as controller of examinations, Loyola College, Chennai, secretary and correspondent, Loyola College, director, Reis, Chennai, principal, St. Saviour's College, Palayam Kottai, vice principal, St. Joseph's College, Trichy, director of SIS, Trichy, counselor at XLRI, co-investigator for TED and facilitator Excel Toastmasters. He has won numerous awards and scholarships like British Council Technical Collaboration Scholarship Award 88-89, Trainer of Trainers AMESA Cambridge University Student of Exams, and he was a consultant for various programs like Future Perfect Education Commission 2004, Assessing Language Skills of Vernacular Medium le Learners Anai Technical University in 2012, Techniques to Promote Fluency, South Asian Jesuit Conference in 2015. He has handled corporate training assignments for organizations like City, ANT, LNT, Ministry of Civil Aviation, Oil India Limited, Mitsubishi, etc. Before we start with the session by Father Francis, let me now request all the participants who are watching us live on Facebook to kindly like our page and share this video so that more people can see and benefit from the session very soon. Let me now invite the resource person, Father Francis M. Peter, for handling the webinar. Over to you, Father Francis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prashid. And uh, I'm so delighted to be with you. And I'm a little I'm flustered by all this interaction. I don't think 
all that is necessary. We have some excellent people here and you can do something great. Okay, without further ado, ado let me straight away go to what I'm trying to talk about. My little thrust is to say that, can we make a shift as far as teaching is concerned? A shift of perspective from the head to the heart. There are three H's that operate when we learn something. It is the head, the heart, and the hand. The three H's, head, heart, and the hand. So far, we have been predominantly focusing on the head. And now we are saying, especially for the group that we have in session now, we like to shift and make a conscious shift to the heart. And I want to make three different approaches to show you why this shift is necessary and why this shift is going to make a big difference. Now, that is the overarching topic that I'm trying to do. Look at the picture. The picture here speaks about the affective, effective teaching. We thought effective teaching was something else. It's cognitive. Now, what we want to stress is the A, the affective there. And I'm taking a quotation. Some of you may know this quotation. Education is a matter of the heart. Education is the matter of the heart. I'm repeating it twice for some good reason. You will understand it sometime later, perhaps tomorrow. Never mind that. It says, this is a quote from Don Bosco, the founder of the Salvation University, which is sponsoring our great workshop today. Don Bosco said this, way back, education is a matter of the heart. Today, we are discovering this. And then, this is the second little quotation. Feeling enhances learning. It is not just a head. We need the heart. That is my major thrust today. And I want you, I'm sure you will appreciate this and because you have felt it. And we'll see how, some theories. What is my objective today? Okay, right. My objective today is, let's say, uh -huh, to evolve out of these 250 who are live participants and many, many, many more who are watching my pranams to all of you to say that, can we evolve into excellent teachers, efficient teachers, competent teachers, committed teachers, creative teachers, caring, cheerful, a force to reckon with, which can make a difference. That is what we want to do today. Now, if we want to become efficient and energetic teachers, we like to take some statistics. Unfortunately, it shows that only 10% of our teachers are in the top bracket. What's that number? 10%. And there is a little study done, I'm quoting that there, you can see it, done and reported in 2016 in The Economist, which says the top 10% of these teachers do three times better than the last bottom three, 10%. Only 10% do uh, belong to the top echelon, the top group, and they do three times better than others. Now, my question today is to place before you, is it, what is it that makes these people special? What is it that makes them creative, competent, and makes them efficient? That's it. And my question is, can we become, can we become that? That is the search that we are on to in this remainder of a one hour or so. I'm looking at the next one, which says that there are three paths and all three paths 
point to one truth. The one truth is love modifies behavior. This is a quote. Actually, what we want to say is love modifies learning. So far, we were led to believe that we think, therefore we learn. I think we'll agree with that. We think, therefore we learn. Now we say, no, we feel, therefore we learn. This is the shift. This is the change of perspective that I would like to bring in. And my reason for doing this is threefold. Threefold, the three roads leading to the same one. One is your own intuition. Your own experience tells us that love can make people study, make people learn more than discipline. And that is what we are trying to look at. And then we also find in the recent greatly favored science called the neuroscience, the science of the mind. There we say there are so many insights about learning. There's so much of interest now in the area called neuroscience. And neuroscience tells us so much, which makes us believe this intuition, this hunch of us, and tries to say that, yes, it is love that we need today. And the third one is, there are great, inspired, and saintly educationists who have pointed us the way. The threefold approaches to one truth called it is love that makes learning happen. It is feelings that is important in our classroom. Okay, we'll go to the next one. I just want you to want you to enjoy these titles, that's all. And try to see what is your belief in it. It is easy to see it. Challenge yourself. Is this what I believe? What percentage of belief do I have in this one? The easiest way to change, to change uh, the learner's behavior is to make her feel important, wanted, appreciated, or, or loved. I put loved because it is shorter than wanted and it has got a receding line, appreciated. When people feel appreciated, when people feel important, when people feel wanted, that and that is the time learning happens. My question is, is that your intuition? I call this teacher intuition. Is this what you believe? Has it been your experience, personal experience as a learner? We look at it. I'm looking at the first angle which says that it is our intuition, our experience which suggests that we should make a big change in our classrooms from the head to the heart. Now, the second one, I'm going to ask you a question. You have had hundreds of teachers, hundreds, literally from your kindergarten or even before preschool or whatever class till the last class that you sat in, including the present ones, the distant ones. I want you to think of all the teachers, everybody, substitute teachers, games teachers, and, and anybody, anybody, anybody at all was taught you, music teacher, dance teacher, whatever it is, who is your best and most favorite teacher? I want you to actually think of them and count. There are hundreds. I wish we have time uh, we have methods of uh, finding out from each one of you, but that is not possible today uh, because of this distance. It will take a lot of time. There are 300 of you online. Uh, it's not possible. But let me tell you my experience. Wherever I have done it, it simply shows this one fact. You can think of one, two, or three teachers. Right? Not more. Somehow it has always been one, two, or three. Now why? Why do you call them favorite? Why are they preferred teachers? Please think of it. 
I know there is one teacher there, oh, in that class, in the primary class, oh, in the college, oh, this one, yeah, 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 yeah. You remember them well, most favored. I'm not speaking most remembered. You may remember teachers because they were tyrants, they were frightening. Oh, that teacher, oh, please don't ever talk of him. You say that, yeah, not that kind of a teacher, your best and favorite teacher. Of the, all the hundreds that we have, who have taught us, three stand out. And you know why? I wish we could, somebody could talk. Unfortunately, we are not going to allow you that luxury. If we have another chance where we can have a face-to-face, -face, we'll do this. The question is, you will find that they loved you. They cared for you. They showed concern for you. They accompanied you. They handheld you and led you up. These are the people whom you loved. Because they cared for you, they loved you, they showed you the way, they appreciated you. Don't you think it is true? The best teachers are those who cared for us, who were affecting our heart. Right? Now look at this particular one. I want you again to confirm this one little question to be put before you. There are the virtues of a teacher. If I were to choose a teacher for a school, what will I look for as a prime quality? All of them are important. As the most important quality, this is the challenge I'm putting before you or a question before you. Look at them one by one. Which, according to you, is the most important one? I know everybody, everything is important. There's some government regulation, yeah, yeah. But which, according to you, is the most rewarding quality? Just giving you time to read through that. Yeah, everything is nice. Now, I would like to tell you what in the perception of the different people is the most important quality in the next one. Look at this. Qualities that make one a great teacher is cheerfulness and approachability. If I were to be in a, in a, in a let's say, chance to recruit a teacher, I'm looking at a teacher who is not grumpy. I don't want a sad teacher. I'm a cheerful teacher. Is a teacher approachable? Is there somewhere I can find out if she's caring and concerned? Can she make learning easy and not go about with a stick and frighten? Those are the things. Look at this order. This is what research has shown. People who make a difference are in this order in this order very clearly. Those who have these qualities in this order are the ones who will make great teacher. I ask you about those 10% who are the top. You want to be there? You want to be one of the top 10%? Yes, please try to be this. Not well, knowledge and degree you've got it. You can certainly uh, train to teach effectively. All, all, all those things are there. What is it that you need to do? What more should you do? Look at this. Cheerful, approachable. It doesn't cost you one dime to smile. I know you are already doing it, but can you do it a little more? Can you look at the class in your vision, in your mind, at every student? Are you cheerful every time? Is this what every student in your class will perceive? Perceive you as a cheerful fellow, cheerful lady? Cheerful teacher? Approachable? Can they talk to you? Are you caring and concerned? The other things are, you are there, you have it. That is your experience. You also know this. If you have this, you will be in this top 10% of teachers whose impact will be three times greater than the last 10%. The secret is simply this. And let me come to another one. I'm going to show you a picture, the picture of a desert. Look at the burning desert. Even the camera is dazzling. 
this is the symbol of a poor student dull student look at the place not a drop of rain is it real i'll tell you where it is ah this is called death valley this is in eastern california the driest hottest and the dirtiest place where there is not one drop of of rain this place has been there for me this symbolizes the students some of our students whom we like to say useless idiotic and numbskulls no amount of drilling will do any good not a drop of learning can penetrate their skulls we have said all these things these these are the people whom we now like to see and i like to tell you what happened in my next slide once in the year 2004 in the winter there was a unexpected sudden and a miraculous rain seven inches of rain and this was in winter by the next year by the spring the entire floor was carpeted with flowers you want to see that here you are it is possible this is a miracle of miracles and this for me is again the symbol of the poor students the unwilling student the idiotic student whom we neglect and reject and there they are telling us something look here in them there is still learning possible in these people there is still life there is it's only dormant seeds of possibility is still there within them and they are waiting waiting for your loving touch your care your concern if it is there there will be a big big difference they can spring to life when the right conditions the right climate the right possibility prevails life like learning is inevitable life cannot be killed so is learning there is nobody who cannot learn do we believe this does this picture come to mind whenever we look at somebody whom we say useless idiot why do such people ever come to my class i'm sorry i have also said these things i have also heard these things said and if it's superior and nice why do i waste my time asking you idiot this question i've done this but in that in that place we have the possibility of something great that can happen and this is what we are looking at we'll go to the next one i'm coming to the second one how great people have also come to the same conclusion that we are saying this is most of you know from this university is don bosco a person who has been admirable and is known for his care concern and love for the youth and look at his statement i wish this sinks into us hey do you love your students hey that's not enough do they know that you love them ask yourself this question i know there was one american president uh, where i tell you also it's john f kennedy who asked ask not what america can do for you ask what you can do for america like that he is putting it on its head and saying that don't suffice and say that i love them yes you love them very good but excuse me do they know you love them i like to give a certificate i mean as kind of a collect opinion from every student does teacher so and so teacher visha teacher deepa teacher maina teacher viva teacher anu teacher nyaneshwari i don't know i'm sorry i just rattled out some names that i i remember from your list that's all you do does she love you you individually every time if they say yes you are a good teacher you are in the top bracket love them i i i like this quotation i like this quotation this has to sink into us it must be in front of you and it it may it must make a big difference to you now what is the philosophy of this great man he says when there is love it breaks all the barriers to learning 
Love is something that makes learning possible. If we were face to face, I will do this little activity. You please try this. Ask your friend to close their fist like this. Okay? And you try to open, price open this fist. Your job is not to allow it. You will try to open one finger and then come to the next one. This will close. This will close. No, uh, I won't be able to do it with life here. But simply said, unless I want, unless I want it, I cannot open my hand. You cannot price open my hand unless I'm willing. And that will happen when only when I trust you, when I love you, when I want to. So he says, love is the key that can break any barriers. And once there is love, there is no fear and there is laughter. That is an indicator of absence of fear, love, laughter. And when these are there, definitely learning will take place. This is my summary of making it easier with the three L, but this is the spirit of this great man. Love, laughter, learning, the approach. Can we follow it? In our class, is there a sense of relaxed one? You know, no constraint. I don't feel, I mean, the kind of a constraint in a class I said, oh no, why should I? How many classes I have sat? I'm sure you also have sat. Sit like this in a tight way, breathing like this. And when the bell goes and the teacher goes away, thank God, because he's a hell of a teacher. I know one teacher, oh my God. I don't want to give uh, details. He said, terror. If you turn a little, he says, get up. And he has got a harsh bass voice, which will tremble right you. You will be just, you will be frightened out of your skin. You will be shivering out of your pants. Panting, breathless and breathing, pantless. That is what happens when you're frightened. Your classroom, our people, Disciplined, yes, but are they frightened? We'll think, we'll come to more about it. And then this learning comes. Now, another philosophy of this great man, which I love very much today, everybody endorses that, is that there are two ways which can cause learning. One is the stick method. That's called the repressive method. I can repress and make you by command by trying to cajole, by constrating, command, coerce, and cajole. This way, I can make you learn. If you don't learn, you will clench my teeth. You will learn. Many people have learned like that. That is one way of learning. Compliance out of fear. This is one method of learning. How many people have memorized grammar tables just out of fear? But here is this great man who said that, no, no repressive action. It is not repression. It is prevention. He calls it a preventive act. Affect feeling, he said. You shower them with so much love. You show that you care that he dares not do anything to offend you. The approach is love approach. The prem mark. Interesting. That's it is. Prevent them from doing anything nonsensical because you are somebody they cannot afford to hurt. He says this, this alone will last. We have seen this. I've seen it myself in some of the rural places where the schools of Tom Bosco, the Salations have been teaching. Those students who are nowhere now come up attached, attached to the fathers there and deeply committed. That is the love bond of love. I think this is the charism of most of you who are working in a salvation school. You must try to do this. And look at one more. What is it he's trying to say, the third one? This is the same principle of all the great philosophers. 
I, I find that this is something that is practical and useful and therefore I'm giving, I can give you a high fund of philosophy of Vygotsky, of Nedindik and all those people, but uh, nothing like this. He says, converse with them, counsel them, guide them, correct them in such a way they feel involved that you showed that you care, that you love them so much so they prevent them from going wrong. This is your educational philosophy. This is the effective way of teaching. They will learn. Learning, we actually, I have done my PhD, double PhD in learning. And my specialization first one was teaching English to the disadvantaged. I tell you, still now, I don't know how learning takes place. But I know one thing. If a person likes you, he will learn it. Not because the subject is great, but because he likes my teacher. I will never let down this teacher. That and that alone can do. It's not your degree. It's not your position. It's not your experience. It's your smile. It's your pat. It's your appreciation and says that, come, never mind. I'll teach you after class. Drop it. Those are the things. Okay. I will have to go a little fast. Oh, now this is a little quotation that will explain everything for us. That is, with a little bit of light and warmth, the saint says, with a little bit of rain and room, the tiniest seed of hope can hold forth and bloom. This is my summary of what is there. The next one. Now, I'm giving you a kind of an example. Look at this. There is a lot of lettuce planted here. I love lettuce and anything green for salads. Lovely. Now, if these salad uh, tree, the lettuce doesn't grow, what do you do? Do you blame them? No, you dig it up. You put a little manure. You make sure there is a little sunlight and less rain perhaps. I don't know. You control. You fertilize it. You try to do and make sure that it grows. Perhaps you add insecticide. You try to help the plant grow and give fruit. Now, look at the way you treat your student. Your student, he said that you are a buddhu. You are a good for nothing fellow. You cannot be taught, get lost. Why don't you do the same treatment of digging, of putting insecticide, the metaphorical way, and adding water, or manure, caring for it, it has to bloom. That is the philosophy that we want. Now, I want you to remember everything the saint has said, I'm summarizing with the three A's. Three A's. If you show attention, affection, and appreciation, they will make a big difference. Do you pay attention to every student? Show affection? and appreciation. That's it. I'll come to the next one. I'm sorry for it. I'm a little bit. This is the new science called, called neuroscience. This is a very famous and presently much sought after and much talked about science. He says, according to this science, neuroscience suggests emotions and proofs profoundly affect learning. Learning, attention, Memory, decision making, social functioning, everything is emotion based. So far, we didn't think of it from a scientific point of view. We were having this, all these things. If the saint had said it, I, yeah, you know, these people. But now it is with unassailable logic they are trying to prove. This is what is majorly done. I'm going to move to the next one. Or the same. Neuroscience says that a child will not learn anything from someone she doesn't like. We know it. Allow this frame one sentence to sink into you. This is neuroscience. If the child doesn't like you, you can not teach one bit to her. You learn when you feel and you're made to feel that you are making some progress. 
Have you ever appreciated? That's good. I like the progress you make, or at least say that you have a good handwriting. One word of appreciation once can go thing. I'll show you a little clip and then you will appreciate it. A friendly, supportive, non-threatening atmosphere. Is this what characterizes your classroom? Friendly, supportive, non-threatening? That would be very nice. And now there's something called intrinsic motivation, which is more interested than other. Now look at that. I told you this, I'm going fast. Oh my, 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 my. yes, oh, 11.42. Let us look at this particular thing also. An affective, effective learning. Again, from neuroscience. Affective, effective learning of neuroscience says that joy is an integral part of a learning experience. If the child does not enjoy either the process or the product or the appreciation, there will be no learning. Joy is the integral part of any learning experience, says the great scientific insights of neuroscience. The mind is made up like that. Do you provide joy? And he goes on to say that how today's work world kills joy, provides stress, pressure, repulsion, negativity, and the joy is completely lost. And you want them to learn? How can we make our classroom exciting, enjoyable? Now, joy and fear are totally opposed, two ends. And then if you want to put a little scientific terms, Amygdala and all those things are here. You can read, but I don't want to bother you with this. Let me tell you now. I'm going to uh, request Srijit to please play a little short movie. You might have seen it, but it is my favorite. It's called Make a Difference. You might have seen it, but in this context, please look at it. Uh, Srijit, you're there? Yes, for the mad. Yeah, the mad one, please. Yeah. As she stood in front of her fifth grade class on the first day of school, she told the children an untruth. Like most teachers, she looked at her students and said that she loved them all the same. However, that was impossible because there in the front row, slumped in his seat, was a little boy named Teddy Stallard. Miss Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he didn't play well with other children, that his clothes were messy, and that he constantly needed a bath. And Teddy could be unpleasant. It got to the point where Miss Thompson would actually take delight in marking his papers with a broad red pen, making bold X's, and then putting a big F at the top of his papers. At the school where Miss Thompson taught, she was required to review each child's past records. And she Teddy's off until the last. However, when she reviewed his file, she was in for a surprise. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and has good manners. He is such a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he is troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, his mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest and his home life will soon affect him if some steps aren't taken. 
Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends and he sometimes sleeps in class. By now, Miss Thompson realized the problem and she was ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when her students brought her Christmas presents wrapped in beautiful ribbons, bright paper, except for Teddy's. His present was clumsily wrapped in heavy brown paper that he got from a grocery bag. Miss Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of the other presents. Some of the students started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet, some of the stones missing, and a bottle that was one quarter full of perfume. But she stifled the children's laughter when he exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was, putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume on her wrist. Teddy Stallard stayed after school that day, just long enough to say, Miss Thompson, today you smell just like my mom used to. After the children left, she cried for at least an hour. On that very day, she quit teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. Instead, she began to teach children. Miss Thompson paid particular attention to Teddy. As she worked with him, his mind began to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. By the end of the year, Teddy had become one of the smartest children in the class. And, despite her lie that she would love all the children the same, Teddy became one of her teacher's pets. A year later, she found a note under her door from Teddy, telling her that she was the best teacher he'd ever had in his whole life. Six years went by before she got another note from Teddy. He then wrote that he had finished high school third in his class, still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Four years after that, she got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, he'd stayed in school. He'd stuck with it and would soon graduate from college with the highest of honors. Again, he assured Miss Thompson that she was still the best and favorite teacher he'd ever had. Then four more years passed and yet another letter came. After he got his bachelor's degree, he had decided to go a little further. She was still the best and favorite teacher he'd ever had. But now, his name was a little longer. The letter was signed, Theodor F. Stallard, M.D. The story does not end here. There was yet another letter that spring. Teddy said he'd met this girl and was going to be married. He explained that his father had died a couple of years ago, and he's wondering if Miss Thompson might agree to sit at the wedding in the place that was usually reserved for the mother of the groom. Of course Miss Thompson did, and guess what? She wore that bracelet, the one with several rhinestones missing. Moreover, she made sure she was wearing the perfume that Teddy remembered his mother wearing on their last Christmas together. They hugged each other, and Dr. Staller whispered in Miss Thompson's ear, Thank you for believing in me. Thank you so much for making me feel important and showing me that I could make a difference. Miss Thompson, with tears in her eyes, whispered back. She said, Teddy, you have it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you.
you never tell what type of impact you may have on another I, I think in the interest of safety, can we stop here? Action. Can we pause here? Yes. Uh, friends, I'm just a few more lines would have gone on. I mean, a few more frames. I forget. I'm sorry. I have watched this. I bought it, this one in England, with the money I had for lunch. I sacrificed my lunch and bought this one 16 years ago. I watched it over and over again. And every time I watch it, my eyes cannot remain dry. That is the power of this. Now, all I'm asking is, you have seen something like this happening in your place. You have in your class some teddies who are an irritation, a pain, and you, you simply can't teach, but there is a, there is a tragedy behind them. Are we aware of it? Can you change them into somebody great? What is the great, great thing you can do by taking somebody who is already good and making them better? Or to use some of my other phrases is, take a horse and make it into a race horse. It's okay, good horse into a race horse. Yeah, fine. But can you take a donkey and make it into a horse? That is what is a challenge. And that is what we teachers ought to do. And that is what we see this teacher doing. Amazing. What transformation. And what is the source of the transformation? There was no mention of teaching at all. Everything was spoken of was love, a smile, a pat, an appreciation, and a response. Teacher, you are my best and most favorite teacher. A little gesture, when those little gifts came, she stifled the laughter of others. And what did she do? She was able to dab it on her and put on the rhinestone missing bracelet to show I, you mean something to me. I want you to feel you are my specially loved person. And that makes him blossom. Love blossoms the mind. There is everything else, everything else, whatever we have studied in beard, in M and that is secondary. I'm not saying it is useless. It is secondary. Unless we have this firmly believed, firmly believed something like what is called the, the, the love inside us, it won't work. Uh, I don't know whether I can get back my, oh yes, I'll start sharing again, yes. Oof. I'll go back to where I let, yes, it was here. Yeah, look at it. How do we show this love practically? I'm having some little questions for you and practical things for you. Yes, yes, yeah, please look at this. Neuroscience speaks about the feedback that we give. Any experience that happens with the people has got three kinds of effect. It can be pervasive, permanent, and personal. Again, I'm trying to use the three P's method so that you can remember it better. The impression that people get can be pervasive, permanent, or personal. Okay, what is pervasive? It's largely, I mean, globally, that's all I feel of. I'll give you examples. Permanent is not, you know, it's either temporary or permanent in that sense. Personal is, you know, internal or external. I'm giving you an example, number one. Somebody gets a failed grade. The grade that person gets is a fail. You can taunt that person. You can fool that person. You can humiliate that person. And you can make the person feel that you are an idiot, you are a buddhu. And that's why this happened. And you are handing him down a global, that is pervasive, pervasive two ways, global, permanent, not temporary, and internal, the personalization part is internal, statement about his ability. He makes 
and we believe that he is a buddhu he lacks intelligence and therefore he cannot score not only in this test but in any test there is nothing he can do to change it this is the feeling that he gets unconsciously we have somehow entrained this particular thing in that person what should we do is a question that you are asking very good look at this one supposing he is made to see that the score he has got is largely because of circumstances what happened before the exams or possibly because the paper was really hard man it's all right it's not the end of it one single failure does not define you you can still come up and then he finds it not global but a specific experience not a permanent one but a temporary failure not internal but external you see the contrast it is a failure both cases but the explanation he understands is that it is not a doom it is not a fixed one it is not carved on stone i can still come up you we you and i teachers can make this difference if somebody is made to feel this global permanent internal experience of this one we we can never 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 be able to come out now listen to this it is not what happens to us but what we are made to think about what happens to us that makes a difference everybody every one of us have got faced failures but what were you made to feel i know there are persons who went on the stage and ready to make a big they go on the stage blank forgot i know a very important man who went in front of the tv screen to give a talk he stands there he says good afternoon everybody finished he cannot say anything they had to abandon it and come back now if you have not handled it well this will be a permanent scar and you can never ever do anything how do you handle failure how do you mediate failure for your children it's all right what happened before the exam you had a quarrel with somebody you went out you didn't sleep well oh this particular thing you didn't revise all right all right you can do it again you know what a relief it can be this is what we can do when we say how do we do how do we show love now look at this one what kind of a feedback i am giving you the helpful feedback that is given basically there are four types of feedback that we give ask yourself what is the feedback that you give one is about the quality of the work that you do that is you can say it is right or wrong or you can give directions you get more information no that you can add this one or something like this so it is about the quality or your feedback can be about the processing no you you simply copy this there are two paragraphs you can combine these two you can give another example you are simply repeating one example that is in the book why can't you think of another one i asked for example is a give me a fruit whose name ends with the letter e ah uh, i can think of one now he said yeah i gave you one yeah chili no oh, chili is not a fruit here yeah, is it he said look at this fellow he says chili he hey, you can laugh but you can simply help him help him understand this and then it's about self regulation that is about student self evaluation and self confidence you can give a feedback or you can give a student as a person he is good he is smart is this that now which of these has got greatest effect according to neuropsychology he says oh my god the feedback that is most useful is the feedback on the process or strategy on the quality of work and on the process that is the first one and the second one these are the ones that really helpful it is right 
but you must do this and more like this. You can add this. And how to get more marks? These are the feedback. Not good, very smart fellow, very good boy. You got eight, you know. It doesn't seem to help. How to help the people is interesting. I'm skipping this. We'll come to the next one. And now I want to say, ask you whether in class, who are you when you give feedback? There are two images I give you. Let's come to football. In a football, there is an umpire, a referee, and there is a coach. There is a big difference between the two. What does the coach do? He is interested in the team, in the players. He goes with them, runs with them, tells them, hey, come here. No, don't do that. You are a cricket player. Take the ball. Hold it like this. One finger. You must be over the ball. Okay, I'm sorry. There are lots of ladies. You may still like it. Yeah, today everybody plays. How to hold, how to reach, how to throw over their arm. You train them. You help them. And if you try to do it, come again. I'll give you more practice. I think you're good at batting. Or you must come here. When you want to field, how to do We give details. The coach is really interested and shapes and gives feedback and makes things better. The other one is a referee. Who is a referee? He plays by the rules. Right is right and wrong is wrong and there's nothing between the two. You have done something wrong. Whee, 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 whee. It blows the whistle and say, out, get out. Yellow card, red card. He runs with you. He watches you, but only to criticize. I'm asking you a question. In class, who are we? Referee or a coach? Look at this next slide. I'm trying to give the difference between the two. You please read that. Coach walks alongside the player, runs with you, watches what you do, how you run, how you pass the ball, and where you pass the ball. Are you selfish? Can you pass it and get it back? You know, if there is, there's actually, I have a video, but I'm, I don't think I'm going to show it to you. How a coach can make a difference to a player and molds him. Whereas the referee, he says, out, you cross the out, out, blow the whistle, that's all. Blow the whistle in their face. He walks alongside. Now we ask you a question. Am I walking alongside my student? Or am I there only to blow the whistle in their face? Take the second one. Each one you ask the same question. Do I demonstrate how to study? How this maths, this mathematic problem can be solved? Do I demonstrate? But whereas the referee knows how the game should be played and he prescribes, that's all. He says, if you don't follow it, you'll get out. I don't want you. Referee is the one who says, this is the rule. You have not followed the rule. Get out. Coach is the one who says, now, this is how it has to be played. Come here. Don't lift your leg. I'll put your hand behind you. Yeah. It, uh, don't touch the ball when you are playing football. It teaches you. Here, he says it is out. He helps, guides, supports, motivates. Here, he prescribes. And no empathy. If you're out, you're out. Who are you? Read everything like this. And uh, this is a kind of a conscious exam. Are you really a coach or a referee? What do we, I know sometimes you have to be a referee, fine. But which are you more? What percentage? Are you 65% referee and uh, less coach? Now, how do you want to change? What percentage of coach do you want to be? When do you want to be a coach and when can you be a referee? You play, you are the teacher, you know best, but then you have to find out. This is the same thing. I'll give you another analogy. Yes, okay, let me think. 
in the court room there are two people the one there is a victim one there is an accuser but we have a lawyer and a judge what is the difference between the lawyer and the judge even if there is a client who has made a problem who has created a problem the judge the uh, lawyer simply says sir considering that this is the first time he has done it and he is young and he has got a whole future he has to take it kindly give him the least penalty i plead my lord my lord he didn't intend to do it he was forced it is a rage or something he pleads for it whereas the the, the judge he says according to ipc 4433 i give him he only gives the rules punishes he doesn't plead doesn't try to understand doesn't try to exonerate are you the judge or the lawyer what do you want to be there are sometimes yes but then but then which is more if you can make a little graph and find out are you more a judge or more a lawyer what do you want to be lawyer or a judge referee or a coach these are issues that really matter that will make a difference for the students i want you to keep in mind that ted a useless nearly drop out with no friends who can become an md all all because of a third standard teacher's love a pat on the back as it could have been a socially unacceptable criminal but for this i also have if there's more time i would have certainly shown you this there is a there is a movie if you have a chance please watch it it's called men of honor where one of the black captains of a ship loses his leg and he is decommissioned but he wants to come back and join the navy he had a quarrel with a white officer but it is that white officer who trains him and encourages him and slowly says you can come back and finally he goes and presents himself and says that i have to come back and he says one of the rules if you have to come back and let's say that you are in a navy ship and it's been bombarded you plummet down you must be able to swim on your own and you would be wearing such a heavy thing now demonstrate that so they put on a heavy metal guard on him and this white man encourages him he has to take 14 14 steps with that heavy one that movie is is, is a very touching one how he encourages him come on come on you can do it i want that left that leg finally he does it is a black man and a white man how they encourage and how they make it possible for him then he says the whole court here and the presence on the boss of the english american navy i reinstate you colonel so and so back to your trench everybody bursts out in tears you have seen so many things like this why can't we be like that that is affecting one read this read this and let it sink into us that's what theodore was told teach children don't teach maths don't teach physics don't teach subjects teach children make a difference you must be make a teachers who make a difference okay now how is it done i'm asking you to read this first enthusiasm i told you about when i talked about don bosco the three l's i don't know if you remember the three l's ah love laughter learning this is how he said if you want to teach somebody how to build let's say these are all students of navy or students who are of a Uh, let's say architect who want to make engineering uh, naval engineering you can give them all the theory about it what is a boat what is buoyancy how to make it float 
what is rotation law and what are the forces of uh, and how it can toss you, how to keep it like that. Okay, all those things you can give and make them do mathematical symbols and try to stand out. Another one is, if you really want people to build a ship, don't say, go and bring this, go and bring that and do this. Instead, put them in a ship. Pick them roll like this. They'll be so excited. Throw them into the vast and endless sea of knowledge. This is only a metaphor. Do we do something that will be exciting for them? Where they learn by doing, where, where there's so much of interest and said, why, why not kind of a question? I'm sure when they start thinking that the class will be wonderful, they must say, you are different. They must wait for your classes. They must say, your classes makes a big difference. And therefore, they love to come to your class. There is so much learning. Years after, they must say that, teacher, you remember this class? You remember? There is, in our place, in XLR here, a good friend of mine, there was one father, an American priest. He is uh, called Father McGrath. I just want to tell you this story as it comes to my mind. This Senior students, much senior. Today they are 65 and all, they come for a get together and then they're sharing the things. Then they used to tell me this story. During the class, it's a co-education class, all MBA students, senior students with coat and tie and everybody. While they're, he's teaching, six people considered boorish, Adivasi kind of a thing with black things and the leaves on their head and all, suddenly enter the class and jump around and dance. And they go straight to the girls and try to tease them and oh, they sing and dance and yell. The boys are furious. Oh, they want to, they want to attack. They want to, they jump and they oh, they also shout. There is chaos. Finally, they run away. They run away. And the, there is such a commotion in the class. Father, how can you allow this thing? Go call the police. This, that, that, we must do something. He said, wait, wait, wait a minute. He said, yes, true. He said, let us, let us let us do something. You want me to write to the police? Yes, we'll all write. Let us draft a letter. A, a letter to the police commissioner saying what happened and what should be done. Okay, this were being drafted. Then he said, we must describe the people. How many were there? So many. What were they like? Slowly he started explaining. And he said he was a tall, he was like, then he said, listen, this person whom you are describing, doesn't he look like your senior? So and so, these are first year classes. Yeah, somebody said, and this person, doesn't he look like this, the other person? Yes, they said, and they all laughed. Okay, now we understand. You have set them up and asked them to dress up like these, uh, I don't know, like these uh, boring barbarians to come and trouble it so that you can make a realistic police complaint, how to write. That they say they never, never forget. How they do it, the classroom would be very interesting. There was another person who told us that one day to class, history class, one teacher comes fully dressed like, I think, uh, Sivaji Maharaj. Only thing he didn't have a horse. Da -da, he's going to sing there and come with these things. And the class just claps. He says, even today they remember that. The class becomes exciting. Do you bring excitement into your class? That's all this, this particular, uh, this short is trying to say. We can't, we are not going to build ships. We are not going to take them to the sea, but it's a metaphor to show that, can you excite them into learning rather than bore them with details and formulas? Memorize this. Oh, what is the formula for the circumference of a, oh no, my God, is it 3.1, uh, 3.148, oh, boring. Don't bore them, please. Is there another way of doing it? That is what we need to do. Okay, I'll come to the last one. When you teach, I want you to keep this particular one in mind. This is one of my quotations. Uh, some of you would know the fish. You know the fish scene and you know that 
you can't catch every fish with the same bait. Different fish needs different bait. I mean, if you don't understand that, okay, we'll at least think of rats. Rats is a ubiquitous problem. How do we catch a rat? What do we have in the rat trap? Oh, you have a vada. Yes. And the rat comes and looks today. What do we have? Vada, same thing yesterday also. Toby also. Ah, I'm not interested. It goes away. Even a rat wants a different thing. What does it want? It wants fish. Ah, uh -huh. the rat is very juicy. And one fellow says, I want fried fish. I want variety. If rat wants different things to eat, to be presented, why shouldn't human beings also desire variety? Is there variety in our classroom? Is our classroom pattern, say, these are all kids we are teaching. Is it the same way right from the beginning to the end? Is there something exciting, something to make them feel that, yeah, I got it, I won, I'm happy. I got something. You don't ask them the questions that they don't know. Ask them a question that they can answer. What do I do? One of the things I do is like, uh, let's say, simple. Let me ask one question. I'm thinking of uh, one little act that they say that I've gone to the class and tell them, is it now, children, please tell me any invention and tell me the inventor. What do we normally do? We tell them, who invented radio? You, 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 stand up on the bench. Up, up, okay. This is threatening. What am I doing now? You tell me any sadhana and then tell me who invented it. That would be interesting. They'll feel, yes, that's right, yeah, he said. Or in a geography class. Tell me a country and its capital. What is the capital of Czechoslovakia? I don't want to ask us this because if we ask, I don't know. I myself don't know this. But if you ask them, prepare tomorrow, I'm going to ask you countries and their capitals. And they come with this kind of a knowledge. So they have something to show off, something that is exciting. Something that is interesting. Okay, let me give one more example and then see. I want to teach them, let's say, parts of the body. We have a game, head, shoulder, whether now all, all those things. Yeah, that's very good, very, very exciting, very nice. I want this to be remembered because we have the three R method. Supposing for your homework, you tell them, children, for your homework, go home and trace the left hand of your mother and write down the names of the fingers of your mother. Look at this as a homework. What is your intention? You want them to remember the names of the fingers which you have taught, which you have done through other things. He said, which finger did it by little finger on the left? All those things are nice, but I want to find out if they can write, if they can remember it, if they can use it. So my, instead of writing, write for your homework three times, the cover oh, was boring, Why this is what I was done. I hated that. If you can do it, something interesting, try to tell them is that, trace your mother's hand. Imagine what happens. This fellow comes running, or this girl comes running home. He said, mommy, mommy, put out your hand. He said, why darling, what did I do? What wrong? No, mommy, please, I'm doing homework. Put out your hand. Put out my hand, not like this, in the other way, and put it on a paper. I said, why, darling? So they sit. And he explains what happened. And while he sits, he's making the tracing of the finger. Exp spread out your fingers. And he says, little finger, the ring finger. He does it. There is a bond of love. And then he takes, writes the names of each of the finger. And writes that, my mom's hand. And the next day, the whole class is full of mother's hands. What a sight it would be. I'm just giving something. Can we make our classroom different? Can we make people do things differently? Different fish needs different bait. Do your students 
need different bait? Have we thought of different bait other than what is there? We, we, we can easily think of excuses. Oh, we don't have all oh, my syllabus. Oh, I can't. Oh, yes. So many O's and R's. But tell me, is it impossible for us to do one thing if you are really interested? One thing, one day. One question I ask if you are want to be that excellent teacher whom I began with, I'm trying to ask one question simply that. If you want to be that excellent teacher, my question number one is, when is the last time you did something exciting with me? When was the last time you did something exciting with me? Last week? Last month? Last year? No? I think we have to rethink this or pack up and go somewhere else. We can be driving autos. That is routine thing. If you cannot do something a little different, we have no right to be teachers. Okay, the next one. Uh, okay, I'll skip this. Right, friends? I told you this. You want to be ordinary teacher? Please look at this. Ordinary teacher does this. But if you are an extraordinary teacher, you must anticipate their needs. Who are you? The top 10 or the bottom 10? You can make a difference. Then you must anticipate their needs and try to do The last one little thing is here. I spoke about in the beginning about the three hedges. I'm repeating that. What the heart loves and the hand has practiced, the head will never forget. Start with love. Then you have practice. Then you come to the logic of it. Okay? Now, finally, I'll come to... Okay, fine. The last little one is how to make the class interesting. I'm giving you 10 little hints and we'll stop with this. Is your learner motivated in class? Is there a reduction of anxiety and fear among the learners in your class? Is the learning challenging and interesting? Are you repeating what has been taught in different ways in different contexts? Do you make it multisensory like painting, drawing, making them dance? Do students find out rather than you telling them? I'll do this if there is another occasion, but not now. I want to encourage participate, participants learning. Okay? And then keep input a little above their levels. I'm going fast. I think we are a little. I'm now asking Srijit, would you please play the last video that we gave there? Okay, further. Yeah, thank you. Now, my question is, remember, your students are like the pencil. I have a parable of the pencil. Your students are the pencil. I'm, I'm ending with this. Your student is like a pencil because the best of the pencil is inside it, not outside. Right? The best lies within you. The color, the lead is inside. Outside is only wood. Second, every time you sharpen the pencil, it improves. So is the student. You sharpen him, he will improve. Third one, the pencil can make some errors. When you go wrong, correct yourself with the eraser at the back. It is possible to make mistakes and it is quite normal. Last one, Please make sure that you make a mark in others' lives with your pencil. And in the hand of your trained expert, your teacher, you can really become a masterpiece creator. Right, friends? I would now like to finish with the last little video for two minutes where the best teachers are adored. People touch their feet and say, you are my greatest. I want you to be one of them. 
you can certainly do that. Please watch this. He's a really, really, really great teacher. And he inspires a lot of people. She is... ...a very wonderful teacher, and she is a very good friend. Oh. I don't know. He's just a very genuine person. Compassionate. A genius in his own way. Yeah, I'd say he's pretty different. He's a very smart guy and he also likes to have fun. It's usually funny. It's funnier than normal. He tells the best jokes ever. He provides them the opportunity to make decisions, right or wrong. Disorganized in an organized way. He thinks that it's so beautiful. Uh, thank you for helping me see a different side of science. For everything that she has done for everyone here. Giving me the best year I had in a long time. Holding me responsible to something. She helped me not be afraid. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Mr. Wright. Mr. Pope. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Mixie. Thanks, Mr. Ritz. For singling me out. Thank you, make me confident. Helping us stay healthy and strong. Thank you, Mr. Ritz. Thank you, Mr. Timothy, my pizza home around. For teaching me how to grow these healthy vegetables. I would say thank you for actually caring. To inspire me to be a teacher when I grow up. Thank you for that. You're just an amazing person, so thanks. Right, friends? That's what I was trying to say. One day, there must be videos made of you. On a teacher's day, if the students can actually make videos and say why they love you, why you are special, and all of you are there, and many people say that that is the best treasure that you can take back. And that is the best compliment I would like to see. Actually, this was done in one of the schools right here in Jamshedpur, where after these classes, the teachers decided it was COVID year, and they said the students joined together. We are want to do something for our teachers, and so they said we will do this and put a video and say, "Teacher, we like you for this reason. Will you be among those top ten percent?" Thank you. All the best. Thank you very much, uh, Father, for that uh, beautiful session now uh, from your end. Now um, let me invite. Ms. Juhi Barwa, Director, Human Resources, Assam, Don Bosco University, to speak a few words. Yeah, so a very good afternoon. Uh, Father Francis, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, though I joined late, I think what you said and what I listened to you in the last few minutes is really extremely impactful. Uh, thank you so much, Father. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Prasid for giving us the opportunity to be associated with this esteemed gathering. Uh, so a very, very good afternoon to all of you. I think I must be the only one in this gathering who is from Northeast India. Though, Father Francis, I, I don't know whether you are based out of Jamshedpur now. Yes, I am. <laughs> Okay, so you are geographically close, I think. You're geographically closer to me than, you know. I, and I've, I've, been, I've been there. Been oh, to your yes. place. I've been okay. to the university okay. also, yes. All right, all right. That's, that's so nice to know. So, yes, uh, as I've said, uh, you know, on behalf of Assam Don Bosco University, thank you so much for involving us. Um, I know that you have been through some uh, long sessions. So I, should, I would like to introduce our university to you in brief and continue very much in the same vein as what Father Francis was saying, that in our roles, uh, whether we are teaching or whether we are you know, non-teaching post as well, as long as we are in education, we are here to make a difference to each and every student regardless of their caliber. So it is in this vein that I would like to begin my presentation. I'm going to request Prasit to help me slightly. I, shall I just? You can, you can, you can, you can share your presentation, ma'am. You have the permission to do that. Okay. 
is it visible uh, it's not visible now come on please do uh, share screen okay. share screen i have done yeah okay share screen yes sorry yeah now okay so is it visible now now yes. it is visible ma'am okay great so a very warm welcome to all of you i hope through this presentation i can bring you some of the essence of the northeast at this time of the year it really is winter but as we all know you know we are in the midst of this phenomenal global climate change and it has affected us as well so the temperatures are slightly warmer than what they should be in other times of the year so yes so this is our university we have three campuses uh basically in the city and two on the outskirts but again very much within city limits uh we are a part of the don bosco society uh which is present across 132 countries worldwide so yes we are very much a part of the global family and we cater to 15 million young people worldwide so be it in technical education or be it in regular education we are looking after we feel we are the custodians of this entire multicultural milieu of young people all across the world who are a part of our family we are here in the northeast and being a northeasterner myself i know very much uh, that the northeast is often overlooked not for anything else but because geographically it's said that we are connected to the country by a chicken neck much as i do not like that reference it is true that 99% of our borders are international uh, we are surrounded by myanmar uh, bangladesh uh, nepal so we are very very close to the border in fact where i stay where my hometown is if you walk through the forest natural reserve forest you reach myanmar in 3 days so that is how close we are so this is us we are in guwahati it is known as a land of the seven sisters and the eighth brother i don't know why they have made sikkim a brother but all of that you know the all the other seven states are called the seven sisters the northeast india itself is a very very unique place there are more than 300 tribes each tribe having its own dialect and yet what you will find in northeast india is very much unlike the rest of the country in the sense here that we do not feel the distinction of being different from each other there is very much intercultural peace and harmony yes you may be hearing of some challenges in the news but that is more often because we do uh, we are very close to international borders but apart from that we do not have the system of caste uh, divisiveness or segregation based on your creed or caste it is very very much intercultural uh, wherein each tribe though having its own language and identity uh, you know there is relatively peace and harmony so yes you know it's very very different uh the origins of the university now uh don bosco here basically reach shillong it's another city in meghalaya which is just around 80 100 kilometers from guwahati or rather 80 kilometers from guwahati it's the capital of another state called meghalaya which is land of the clouds so the don bosco fraternity first reached there in 1906 uh they established their sorry they arrived in india in 1906 and they established their institution in shillong in 20, 1920 currently we have around 42 colleges with two added every year that is how we are growing in the country and around a network of 123 technical institutes so starting with our university we are part in fact of a growing legacy which has contributed to education for over 100 years this is our history which i have just said but more particularly our university was founded in 2008 uh, we had the school of technology first uh, the school of commerce and management humanities and social sciences there in life sciences and fundamental and applied sciences so in all we have five schools which look after 19 departments currently these are our campuses uh, this is the azara campus which houses the school of technology along with the departments of commerce uh, and also information technology 
and also the bachelors of business administration. This is our campus right on the banks of the river Brahmaputra. I'm sure you would have heard of the mighty, mighty Brahmaputra every year because of its floods, but also it is the very lifeline of my home state, Assam. So this is on the banks of the river Brahmaputra, and this basically houses the masters of business administration. This is our main campus or our mother campus in Tapasya, which is spread across 270 acres, but we are in a wooded environment, for which reason we have made very judicious use of our, you know, of our land, availing only 3% for our construction purposes and the rest of it for natural environment because we feel that we are the custodians. There is a philosophy in our university wherein we are committed to education uh, for sustainable development, which I will touch upon later in my slides. And you can also see our memorial there, the person for whom we exist, which is Don Bosco. We have a monument to Don Bosco there. Uh, we also have a small memorial of Don Bosco there. Uh, you know, our reverend saint and our founder of our society as you enter the university gate. So when you do enter it, you know, you come across Don Bosco and then you feel the immense legacy, you know, of, you know, of Don Bosco and the entire society. This is our first academic block, which houses the office, uh, you know, the main administrative offices, also a few departments. Uh, as you can see, the structure of the building, because we are in a hilly terrain, you will see that the building has been constructed in a way wherein it is congruent with the natural landscape. There has been no cutting of hills, as you would know in rampant construction, which happens, especially in mountainous or hilly areas, hills are cut, which is bad for the environment and also creates environmental disasters. But here the architectural planning has been in a way where the buildings are congruent with the undulating landscape. And they're also designed in a way wherein we need uh, to use very less energy. These are energy efficient buildings compliant with ECBC 2017, which is the energy code, building code of 2017, which ensures that we are able to harness renewable energy. In fact, all of the roof above has been fitted with solar panels. And if you can see the, the level which is below, well, what happens is there is a basement there wherein you have an underground corridor. Basically, it's subterranean, wherein, as you know, cool air is heavier. So it filters around that building, right? Cool air is heavy, so it circulates the building. And then it kind of cools the entire building. So we have to use less of air conditioning. This is another academic block which we have, which basically houses the life sciences. These are the hostels. This is the women's hostel. We have three women's hostels. We have two men's hostels as of now, and another hostel is in the construction. So overall, we are looking at housing anywhere between 600 to 800 students, uh, you know, providing hostel facility. This is the men's hostel. This is the food court. We have the food court as well, uh, where people can go have the cuisine of their choice as well, the students. And it can approximately seat around 200, around 100 students to 200 students. And it's also got stand-up kiosks, which young people like to avail of, right? So these are our staff quarters, some of our staff quarters, which are available in the campus. This is our guest house. And this is a freshwater lake. Uh, we have around 15 acres of freshwater lake. We have also started social entrepreneurship uh, with introduction of fisheries. So we allow the local villages. We are surrounded by 42 villages. And you know, the intention of the university as in all higher education where it is gravitating towards is that universities are community builders. Community, how, do, how are we community builders? We need to transfer our knowledge and what we learn in theory to practical solutions to help community resolve their day-to-day -day issues. So here we are looking at livelihood opportunities for local villagers and farmers through fishery. 
Here again, we have another water body. So as you can see here, this is an eco-friendly building. I have mentioned SDG because in fact, we are compliant actually with all the, these are the sustainable development goals which have been established by the United Nations. And this particular decade, starting from 2020 to 2030, the, the SDGs were established in 2015 and the timeline is up to 2030. So this particular last decade is called the decade of action. And our university is more committed than ever before in the fulfillment of objectives right from sustainable development goal, which is of no poverty to sustainable development goal number 17 of making a difference through partnerships. So as you can see, this particular block has got the solar panels. We also have 190 acres of agroforestry. So how do we do agroforestry? As you can know, man-animal conflict is increasing more than ever. Through the demonstration of our agroforestry, we intend to show that with human-man conflict increasing more than ever before, we can look at bringing about a resolution for uh, sanctity of habitat for indigenous species, as well as to give livelihood opportunities to rural people who mostly suffer and who live in such, you know, forest or wooded belts or corridors. So we have our tea plantations there. There you will see some more variegated plantation as you can see in the terrace farming. And there on the other side, you can see the impact rankings. Now the impact rankings of the Times Higher Education Survey are wherein they survey institutes right across the US to Asia Pacific. And last year, we are very happy to say that we were in the top 50. Now, if you were to say top 50, mm, but that is across 862 countries wherein you are competing with Harvard, with Stanford, with University of Auckland. And I'm very, very happy to say again that here we have been the only Indian Institute in the top 50, considering in SDG 15, which talks about conservation of life on land. So this is our affiliations. Sam Don Bosco University is recognized under 2B of the UGC Act 1956, also 12B, which is basically a recognition for it to receive grants for research. So we have been approved by all the mandatory bodies, as you can see there, by the UGC, by the AICTE, by the Distance Education Council, by the International Association of Universities, by the Indian Universities Association, also the Association of Commonwealth. And then we have collaborations. These are just a few logos of our major collaborations. However, we have around 72 linkages with institutions, and we have around more than 40 MOUs with various research organizations, as well as higher education organizations, both nationally and internationally. This is a history of our timeline of our university having started from 2008, and we are continuously growing. Sorry, I, okay, and we are continuous. It shows you here till 2018, but of course, we are moving on to 2021, wherein we see a school of education. We see many more multidisciplinary courses coming up. So, you know, the university is growing. We are relatively young in terms of university years. But as you can see from my presentation so far, we have taken considerable strides. So our governance is we are self-governance and autonomous. We are a not-for-profit status. We are owned and managed by Don Bosco Society. And now I will introduce you to our chancellor, Reverend Father, uh, Dr. Stephen Marbley, under whose direction and leadership we have been growing in our university. And then we have our pro-vice chancellor, Reverend Father Joseph Nelanat, again, who is extremely dynamic and active and believes in working shoulder to shoulder with each and every one. Then we have Reverend Father Johnny Jose, also who is our registrar, who basically leads our academic council and takes very critical decision and leads the academic direction and governance of our university. This is a structure. The, the structure which we have in Don Bosco University is decentralized. It is decentralized to the extent of delegating you know, uh, governance and taking decisions for themselves to students. We have a constitution of, uh, you know, the institution associations, wherein we have representatives across the board from faculty members, uh, from teachers, 
from non-teaching staff. So in all, uh, the leadership and governance is that what we call decentralized through distributed leadership and taking ownership. Of course, the educational philosophy of our university, as you can see, is that we intend to basically walk our talk. We believe that we need to take a holistic approach and ensure a commitment to access equity and quality. The vision of our university is we focus on molding intellectually competent, morally upright, socially committed and spiritually inspired persons at the service of India and the world of today and tomorrow by imparting holistic and personalized education. We realize this through the mission of our university, wherein we are a center of knowledge, culture, research, and intellectual ferment. That is our role. And as I have mentioned to you earlier, a commitment is to ensure that we have accessibility to the weaker sections of society. I have already explained about our university profile, the wide linkages which we have, the research centers which we have. There is another very important aspect, which is a legacy of the Don Bosco system of education, is a comprehensive care system, wherein every student entering the portals of Don Bosco University has a mentor from the time the person enters the university to the time that the person leaves, graduates from the university. The courses which we offer. Yes. And this is what we actually operate in. How do we segregate the values, the vision and the mission to our students as well? It just does not sit with the board of management or with the governing body or with the teachers or with the administrative staff. It is ensured that the vision and the mission is cascaded through the Don Bosco University graduate attributes framework wherein we look at knowledge acquisition skills of being intellectually competent, morally upright. We look at communication skills and how the person communicates and networks and treats everybody and values with respect. In socially committed, in being civically responsible, we look at basically the acquisition of our skills. So when we have our board of studies or when we are looking at designing our syllabus and curricula and the delivery of our pedagogy, we do ensure that we work within the graduate attributes framework. That then is further strategized into our strategic framework here, as you can see for the year 2015 to 2020, wherein we are looking research with social relevance. We are looking at open learning environment through our linkages. We're looking at green campus. We're looking at a center for development studies and initiatives to basically take on and promote community-led in, in, improvement initiatives. We then have an incubation and entrepreneurship development cell. And similarly, we have been able to provide through all of the cascading of this strategy, I'm giving an instance, wherein Don Bosco University has provided water purifiers to 12 villages. This was then formally inaugurated by Mr. Thomas Kowalski, who was a then Secretary General of the European Union and his visit to Assam. So this was done in the year 2018, uh, wherein we looked at cascading the strategy. And this is how, wherein we research societal issues, ensure that it is imbibed in our curricula and our research and leads to delivery on the ground of making community lives better. Here you will see certain glimpses where the students during their time with us, during the tenure of their studies, get involved in cultural studies. Here, if you see at the bottom pane, you will see an Anganwadi. As you know, Anganwadis are rural childcare centers. And you will see the condition of the Anganwadi, wherein you see our students again, collaborating with students from the University College of Dublin, and then truly making a difference to ensuring that that Anganwadi is a bright, happy place for the rural children. There in the above panes, you will see us holding a football match. In the second one, you will see them having a focus group uh, discussion with village women on what their you know, problems are. In the third pane, you can see arising from the focus group discussion which they had with women on how they can contribute to livelihood, on what they can bring to the table. Uh, we are talking about mushroom farming. So these are the various things which we talk about wherein we expand from the classroom onto society and the community. 
These are again some of the linkages which we have, industry, academia. Uh, Sam Don Bosco's university is also the nodal center in the Northeast in collaboration with IIT Mumbai for NPTEL courses. These are courses which are now mandated by the UGC and AICTE for blended learning. We have a very comprehensive counseling and campus ministry. We have an English language lab because a lot of our children also come from vernacular backgrounds, wherein we have remedial classes through the English language lab. We have some of these college festivals. We also have classical knowledge, which is basically the Don Bosco University cloud campus. We work through a lot with workshops and conferences. These are some of the academia collaborations which we've had. In fact, Royal Enfield does have a workshop in our university so that mechanical engineering students can get a firsthand experience in, uh, you know, in bike repair. So these are some of the training programs and collaboration. In terms of placements, we are happy to say that our students have got placed with some of the best, uh, be it in national service, such as in the defense forces, uh, be it in corporates, uh, be it in the banking industry, be it in, you know, boomers, which we call like Amazon or Google. And also we are very happy that they have also gone and joined missions like the Sarva Shiksha Abhyan, wherein we have a person who's a district mission coordinator, SSA now in the state of Meghalaya. So across the board, we have our alumni making their mark in whichever field they decide to join. These are some over and above the placements. We also offer internship opportunities. Now, as we know, AICT has made it compulsory for all semesters to be enrolled in internship. So we have a plethora of internship opportunities as well. This is as a culmination of all our efforts. In fact, this year in the year 2020, a Sam Don Bosco University was awarded as the most engaged university of the year. Uh, by the Accreditation Council of the Science Park of the Government of European Union based out of Netherlands. An engaged university means engaged in making a difference to your community. It is just not taking off your graduation degree hat and waiting for your convocation to work off with your graduation scroll. It is that when you graduate, you know that you've made a difference in those four years and you are committed to do so. There again, in the India Institution Innovation Council of our university, we have managed to get a rating of 3.4 by the Ministry of Education Government of India this year. And the academic team, every year we have an academic team, uh, which is kindly put in place by our respected Vice Chancellor. And considering the situation that we've had, uh, we have gravitated to online classes immediately. Well, the Don Bosco system, as you would know now, that we have a certain system and method in place. So in fact, we were amongst the first private university, in fact, to have our online convocation. In fact, I think even before the state universities, IIT Guwahati had their convocation, I think, and Don Bosco University broke new ground again by having their convocation in time. So we've had classes in time. However, because of the current situation, there has been some sense of trepidation. And so our academic theme for this year is that all that we learn, all the values which we imbibe, we must know how to navigate through by searching for meaning in the bits and pieces of life. And how do we intend to do this? We intend to do this by being anchored on to our values, by being anchored to our graduate attributes. And thank you for the presentation. I'm sorry if I was a bit rushed, but I know that I had to keep to a timeline and there's also so much that I wanted to say because, uh, you know, being from the Northeast. So I'd be very happy for any questions. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your thoughts and updating us with more details about the university. Now, uh, we'll be having an assessment of uh, every program that will be happening. So uh, the assessment will be conducted in the form of a link, which will be uh, shared on our website. And the same will be mailed to you. And also this will be made available on our Facebook page. And all the participants, you'll have to ensure that before we move to the next session, which is happening on December 7th, you'll have to uh, fill the assessment and uh, give it to us. And um, the assessment link, uh, it won't be available on the website. It, it, it will not be uh, open after 10 o'clock the very next day, which means we had the session today. The very next day, 
by 10 o'clock the link will expire so before that you all will have to complete your assessment and uh, this will be made available on our website it will be mailed to you as well and also on our facebook page now let me quickly move to the word of thanks first let me thank uh, the resource person for the day father francis m peter for handling an excellent session for us we had an excellent batsman for day one and next let me take this opportunity to thank all the representatives from the university uh, father janaras sangma sdb chancellor and provincial superior father stephen maveli sdb vice chancellor father joseph pro vice vice chancellor father joni registrar of the university next let me thank ms juhi barwa director human resources assam donbos university for that beautiful presentation Uh, let me thank the entire army of password who ensured that registrations kept flowing in at the right time and who coordinated the entire event to whatever extent possible from their end let me thank the technical team headed by mr srijit tr our territory manager and let me thank all the participants who have been watching us inside the zoom also on facebook live and before we leave for the day let me also remind you again to like this video share this live with streaming with maximum of your friends so that more people can watch this sometime later and our next session is happening on december 7 from 3 pm to 4 30 pm and the session will be handled by mr binish k menon head of academics and resources password publishing house thank you very much and let us officially wind up this gathering with national anthem जन गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जलधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे